everyone. I'm Dr. Melissa Lyle, cardiology fellow at Mayo Clinic. Today, we will be discussing how to assess stroke risk in patients with adult congenital heart disease. I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Nasser Amash, professor of medicine, and Dr. Christopher McLeod, associate professor of medicine, who both specialize in this area. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you for Thanks, having us. So I am aware that patients with adult congenital heart disease are at increased risk for stroke, but could you describe the overall incidence in this population? Well, uh, compared to the normal adults with no congenital heart disease, there is a significant increased risk of stroke in adults born with congenital heart disease. And in women, it's around 6 to 8% in their lifespan until the age, until age 65. And in men, it's a bit more, at 8 to 9% in a study done in Canada, including like 30,000 patients followed over a long period of time. So it's a, like a 10 time increased risk compared to patients the same age without congenital heart disease. Wow. Yeah, and, and, but the, and for each specific syndrome, it's obviously different. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, right. it's, uh, yes. And some of them are going to be 100 times yes. uh, more likely than the general population, some of them a few times, yeah. So there are many variables that play roles right. in determining which is the most predisposed, which is the least predisposed, uh, and that patient population is so diverse. And in that regards, what are the most common mechanisms for stroke in this population? Since Chris is here, it's going to be irregular heartbeats, <laughs> right? So atrial fibrillation and flutter, this is very common okay. as patients get older, especially if they have had multiple operations before. I would say that's the number one major what, uh, risk factor. And heart we? failure. Yes. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. heart failure uh, for sure. But heart failure, and uh, we, it's, it's one of the things we just don't know, is how much of that atrial arrhythmia is subclinical okay. and how much of the atrial arrhythmia is a manifestation of the heart failure. And so the left-sided heart disease lesions, patients also with ischemic heart yeah. disease, we're getting into the older population. These are not just kids anymore. And mm -hmm. so older population, probably some of the regular risk factors that we think of, heart failure being the first one for that CHADS to VAS score, and then age for sure. It's an age-dependent yes, uh, increase. Because if, mm -hmm. if you, uh, unfortunately, in our patient populations with congenital heart disease, the chances of him having ha him, them having heart failure increases significantly as they get older. Right. The risk of atrial arrhythmia significantly increases as they get older. And these are two major risk factors for stroke and what and everybody. So it adds a bit. And, and there are more, more factors that, that, that also affect that, like some patients who have problem with clotting, so there are more mm -hmm. risk of strokes. Right. Some, some patients have hole in their heart, so they're at risk of what we call paradoxical embolism. So it, it's added to the complexity, and that's why every patient is different, and we have to assess the risk in every patient and determine what can we do to reduce the risk and prevent strokes because this is the most feared complications because it has significant impact on the patients and their families and everybody around them. So that's that's very concerning. Yeah, I guess the other two things just to add to that is that uh, that are peculiar to this particular group is sort of the Eisenmenger patients yes. where the blood viscosity is different. Okay. You know, the the hemoglobin is higher, but clotting is abnormal. You know. The other thing is that these patients just have many more interventions. And yes. anytime we start sticking catheters in patients, anytime we try and close holes and put plugs in and yes. devices, that's a risk for stroke. You know, and more operations, more surgeries, one of the main risk factors that we worry, one of the main outcomes that we really worry about and counsel patients about is stroke. And so they've just been exposed to more of this. And as a fellow, if I'm seeing a patient with adult congenital heart disease in my clinic, what tools are available to me for risk stratification? Well, when, when uh, we really consider every patient as a, as a single entity where mm -hmm. it's, he's, that patient is different from the next patient we're going right. to see. So it, it really depends on underlying anatomy and then what's the rhythm and what's the associated acquired problem with these patients, keeping in mind that more than one third of our patients are more than 45 years old. So you have to add all of those. So the tools available for us are practically what we know about the risk of strokes in, in acquired heart disease, the risk of stroke in that specific heart disease in that patient, 
keeping in mind also what that patient has had had before, an intervention, surgery. And this is when we assess the risk and they say, okay, do we need to do anything about it? Like start anticoagulation? Can we reduce the risk of stroke without starting anticoagulation? So it's a, it's a case to case. We discuss it all the time. Okay. Yeah, and it's often a, it's a difficult one, definitely at a, at a center that sees a lot of this. Because if you have a patient with pulmonary hypertension who you're worried about a catastrophic bleed in the lungs from pulmonary hemorrhage, starting them on a blood thinner because they have diabetes or yeah. some heart failure or some other uh, comorbidity that would predispose like atrial arrhythmias. It's really, you're, it's a different kind of risk of bleeding. It and is, so we, uh, don't, we don't have a good risk stratifying tool. No, we don't. I mean, uh, those, all those tools that we have for the acquired heart disease patient, we don't have them in congenital, but it's based on the experience. And I, ironically, the same patients who are predisposed for strokes and blood clotting can be predisposed to bleeding. bleeding as well. So you have to really assess the risk, the Eisenmangers and the Fontaines and the patient with liver disease. Mm -hmm. So it's really, I mean, it's the key thing. And keep in mind that these are predominantly young adults. Mm -hmm. And if you commit them to anticoagulation, that's huge for them. Right. Whether no matter what medication we're gonna give them, it's, a, it's different than somebody at an older age group because that's a longer lifespan for them. Mm -hmm. No, it, it really is a hard one. Once you do decide uh, to anticoagulate the patient, what's the general approach for management of anticoagulation? So <laughs> for years, we have depended on warfarin. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's especially in the more complex patients, we feel more comfortable with it. The patients know that's what we need to do. But they read the news, they watch TV, they know about the direct anticoagulants that we have available now, especially that in relation to don't need the blood test with the INR. So that's a, that's, that's a discussion, but most of the time, the vast majority of our patients, they had been on warfarin for a long time. If we really believe they're in increased risk of stroke without significant increased risk of bleeding if they are on warfarin. And, and they have done well for years. We have thousands and thousands of patients who have prosthetic valves and, and irregular heartbeat that have been on warfarin. But the uh, discussion about the newer anticoagulant, the direct ones, is a very valid discussion. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, yeah, it is. And uh, we obviously don't have very much data. There's, there are a couple of very small cohort studies that shows it's safe, but follow-up is not long. That being said, though, even though we've been using warfarin for all these years, we don't have any good data on warfarin right. to see to say <laughs> but it that it makes us is, feed better. Yeah, right. and, and, and they do okay. So yeah. we, I don't, I don't think there's like random clinical trial on warfarin in adult congenital heart disease, but we know it works, and it reduces the risk of stroke by seventy percent in mm -hmm. non-congenital patients, and we feel comfortable with it. And the patients have been on it before, but there is no question that why not the other drugs. As, as we become more and more comfortable using them, especially that in, as compared to adults with acquired heart disease, when you look at causes of stroke in congenital, it's predominantly ischemic stroke, not bleeding. You know, 80% of all strokes are caused by ischemia and 20% by intracranial bleeding and subarachnoid hemorrhages. In adult congenital heart disease uh, patients, 99% is related to ischemia, unless they have an intrinsic uh, problem with the, in the brain that predisposed them to bleeding. So that is a so we, so that is a factor that we have to put into consideration. But we have many patients, in fact, we're doing it frequently now. We give them direct anticoagulants. We mm -hmm. don't use them, we don't uh, give them warfarin. Okay. So I guess in some ways we're extrapolating from these bigger yes. atrial fibrillation trials. And so the Apixaban large trial comparing warfarin uh, against apixaban in patients with atrial fibrillation without congenital heart disease, without mitral stenosis, significant mitral stenosis, even some, and the adoxaban trial, some of these patients had bioprosthetic valves. Some of them had native valve disease, so we're excluding mitral stenosis. There was no signal that these are more dangerous, and there was uh, definitely a trend towards uh, probably less bleeding, which is the real advantage for this. Um, and I guess over time, as we become more comfortable with them, as we get a reversal agent for the 10A inhibitors, yes. 
and we have a reversal agent now for Pradaxa, then I think it's it's, it's probably going to evolve. And there is a, there are two large trials going on now for adults with congenital heart disease who have atrial arrhythmias and using novel anticoagulants, the direct anticoagulants. One of the challenges, I think, of those trials is the diversity of the patients that we see. Of course. Because if somebody has a simple congenital heart disease, like an ASD, or and they have an atrial arrhythmia, and we do an ablation, oh, I'll be very content with using a novel anticoagulation. If you have a Fontaine with a fenestration and the right atrial to PA Fontaine connection, and a fenestration, atrial arrhythmia, I'm not sure I would feel comfortable using mm -hmm. the ligand, mm -hmm. although it might be okay. What do you mm -hmm. think? Yeah, we just don't know. You know, definitely mm -hmm. no, there isn't the level of comfort there for it. Right. But uh, it's just we're starting a new era, and certainly there isn't any evidence out there now that um, these newer agents are going to be yeah. particularly more risky. That's the concern. Are they going to be as effective? We're not sure. I think that one of the things that is borne out by all of the uh, other sort of um, uh, registry or large um, systematic reviews of patients with valvular heart disease is they're at higher risk. Yes, so you thing. do need to have uh, a lower threshold to start an anticoagulant in someone with congenital heart disease okay. because they almost certainly have a higher risk. It is syndrome specific and you can have severe right-sided heart disease, severe right uh, ventricular dilatation and the left atrium is normal. The left atrial appendage is normal. The left-sided heart function is normal. So for that patient, maybe it's wrong. You know? And so it really needs to be very individualized. But if you look at anyone with a left-sided lesion who has valvular heart disease, they're at higher risk of stroke. So what I suggest, if typically with those patients, that nowadays is the shared decision-making with them. So we, I usually tell them what we know and what we don't know and the options on what, how we treat it. If we decide with direct anticoagulant, we say, we use it in an adult patient with acquired heart disease, it has worked, this is the risk of bleeding and so on and so forth, versus with using warfarin, which we have used before. So I think the challenge at time is if somebody has been on warfarin for a long time in a therapeutic range where we want to be for a long time, no complications for a long time, so they say, why would, why would you rock the boat? But in the newer patients, I think we have that fair discussion on what we know, what we know, and then make a joint decision. I mean, uh, as long as the renal function is normal. Uh, and because that's very important for the direct anticoagulants. Mm -hmm. And I guess the other thing, just to make the fellows aware of, younger mm -hmm. patient on warfarin, there's good data that there's going to be less bleeding yes. and less thromboembolic stroke if they check it themselves. Oh, interesting. You know, so the home INR checking, really crucial for the patient. They're going to become better at doing it than their clinic who has change in staff, change in approach. They know when they're traveling. They know when their diet has changed, yeah. and there is evidence. Yeah, so we, they're we, going to be on that. We suggest home INR monitoring in everybody who, can, who really, and they're dependable adult typically because they have had the heart disease for a long time. So, Or the parents are. Or the parents right. are. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That's very helpful information to know. What are the most important and current adult congenital heart disease guidelines that we should be aware of while caring for these patients? So we have the ACCHA guidelines from 2008, but the newest guidelines are going to come out in the next few weeks, I hope, uh, that are a bit different, mm -hmm. looking at disease-specific evaluation and treatment and suggestion on how to monitor these patients. They're going to be, but it's going to be disease specific. There are going to be some section on stroke, but it's uh, typically we talk about stroke in each disease because it varies from one patient, from one disease entity to another. So there are other guidelines, uh, good guideline from the Europeans and the Canadian guidelines uh, from our uh, neighbors up north. So there are three major guidelines on treatment of uh, adults with congenital heart disease. The one. 2008 is a major one. Dr. Warns was this, the first author on it from, from uh, Mayo. And, but the newest guidelines are coming very soon. From an arrhythmia point of view, the, the 2014, um, it's really a consensus statement. Um, first author is Carey. So management of all arrhythmias in adults with congenital heart disease. So there's specifically an algorithm in there for 
how should we treat the adult with congenital heart disease who has an atrial arrhythmia with regards to anticoagulation. So they fully disclose that this is level of evidence C. Yes. <laughs> so there is, this is expert opinion only. There is no data for this. And so they would break up the uh, approach into complex versus simple congenital heart disease. Complex congenital heart disease, and you can, you can have a look at that. It's quite a, 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 um, a complex uh, group of, of disorders. But um, if someone has complex congenital heart disease, you're almost always going to go with warfarin. So very low threshold mm -hmm. and go with warfarin. Simple uh, congenital heart disease, if there is any valvular heart disease lesion, they would say probably uh, go ahead with mm -hmm. anticoagulants. Oh, definitely. Okay. And that would be, and they're, they're guessing, but they're saying probably direct oral anticoagulants or warfarin. But if they don't have any significant valvular heart disease, they're saying you can, and it's simple congenital heart disease, you can probably use a CHADS2 vascor. So this would be the 69-year-old, repaired ASD, now with some atrial fibrillation. How do you treat them? They're 69, they've got diabetes yes. uh, and hypertension. You probably should use a CHAD2 vascular risk score. They're 41 years old, you know, they've had, you know, you can probably go down that route. Yeah, because most patients are that are younger, you know, the CHAD2 vascular is going to be low. I mean, because they're not, they don't have those, mm -hmm. these anti. I think one of the important things to keep in mind is cardioversion in these patients. Uh, we have a protocol in which all, practically everybody who has con congenital heart disease get the TE before cardioversion, and we anticoagulate. And in that case, I think it's okay to use a no, uh, mm -hmm. direct anticoagulant, mm -hmm. right? Before mm -hmm. and after cardioversion. Mm -hmm. I think I feel safe, especially if it's a simple to moderate congenital heart disease. In a complex patient, we err on the safe of what we know what has worked before and use warfarin. But that group of patients, I think that has to be, we have to pay particular attention because with the structural heart disease, they're more dis predisposed to thrombus formation and, and strokes related to cardioversion. So I think I should point that out mm -hmm. specifically. Yeah, the other thing, even though not well reported, but definitely recognized is the you know, if a fellow comes across or one of the adult, uh, adult cardiologists comes across a patient with one of the uh, classical Fontans, this right atrium to PA Fontan, they, these big, can be these very big baggy chambers, despite anticoagulation, the, you can still have thrombus in there. So making sure that you do a TE to make sure that when you cardiovert that patient, I mean, obviously, if the patient is critically ill and... Okay you know, you have to go ahead. But if this is an elective cardioversion, just making sure, even if they've been anticoagulated and their INR has been between two and three, they can still develop the thrombi, the and you can dislodge those, and they can be, you can have a fatal pulmonary embolus in that situation. So making sure that you always do a TE in those patients. I mean, uh, up to 20% of these patients have silent PE without us doing anything. So I think that's very important, especially the RA to PA connections. So. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Amash and Dr. McLeod, for joining us today, and thank you for your insight into this very important topic. And thank you all for joining us on thehart.org on Medscape.